This is the opening to the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. Before we begin, a few notes about the orchestration. This is written for a massive orchestra, but I want to first focus on the special woodwinds that take most of the solos in this opening section. The first, of course, is the bassoon. The second is the E-flat clarinet, which is a small clarinet, smaller than the regular B-flat or A clarinets. The English horn two bass clarinets, the oboe to some extent, and there's an alto flute, which is more for the creation of texture than solo, at least at this point in the piece. There are eight horns, however, we are missing in our session horn five. That is because horn five at least up until now, doesn't have anything to play. For mocking up this piece of music, I have created two Viana Ensemble Pro 6 multi timbral connections. The first one, which are my logic tracks 1 through 14, channels 1 through 14, go to the woodwinds green, which you can see matches over here. Next, on the other side, I have horns and strings on purple, which you see matches over here. And I did that one out of necessity because at this point, which it's March 2019, Logic's multi-port situation is not necessarily tenable. But the other reason is because I'm utilizing the two main players. The first is Vienna Instruments Pro 2. The second is the Synchron player. Vienna Instruments Pro has been around for a couple years. The Synchron player has been around for about a year at this point. This isn't quite the video for all of the technical reasons for splitting these things into two. We're talking about Logic's multiport situation. So I'm just going to dive into the actual music. So we will start with the bassoon part. We are going to solo this so I can get detailed in my explanation about how to render 
a convincing performance. Let's pause right there. As you can see, I keep all of my instances on the Advanced tab because I like to be able to easily dive into some of the advanced parameters on certain articulations. That is because I have configured a musical phrase checklist. This checklist, some people could probably add some things to it, but I find it as a good primer on how to A, be in the right mental headspace so that the technology doesn't stifle any creativity or make anything difficult to troubleshoot. First, is this the right articulation? Since this is a solo passage by the bassoon, and in the score, it is clearly indicated that these are slurs and phrase marks, it only makes sense to use some sort of legato patch. Next, get off the grid. As you can see here, I did this by feel. In the score, it is a solo ad lib, meaning that the soloist is really supposed to take their time with this. There are multiple fermatas, there are spaces to breathe, there are places where the silence can be as musical as the non-silence, and there is a very thick mix of meter and specific rhythms, groups of five, triplets that contain triplets within the triplets, also with grace notes. You've got grace notes on the groups of five. And so it's complicated only in the way it appears on paper, but really most of this is ornamentation. Stravinsky picked the bassoon in this extremely high register because the subject of this ballet is a primitive, unformed world. This is the dawning of human culture and ritual. And so it reflects or mimics some primitive instrument in a way. And you'll notice that not only the bassoon is that way, but you'll notice that the uh, high clarinet is like that in addition to the English horn. So, all that said, it doesn't make sense to be on the grid. This shouldn't be recorded with a metronome. And if you need help doing your own version of the Rite of Spring with virtual instruments by Vienna Symphonic Library, I would highly recommend getting online and finding videos of bassoon players practicing or in a master class or some sort of teacher-student video of a bassoonist learning how to play this or practicing it, because that will help you get to the heart of what it's like to approach a woodwind part on an instrument that, as a matter of producing the sound, has nothing to do with turning wheels, pushing faders, or pressing piano keys. Next, breathe with the phrase and the velocity crossfade as you perform the line. This is obviously recorded automation that I flattened here probably to keep the performance even. But you can see that I wanted this fade in in a certain way that was convincing. Like I was 
breathing beforehand, maybe like right here, preparing the note mentally with my own breath. And what I mean by that is, as I'm pushing the piano keys and moving the mod wheel, I'm saying that I'm actually breathing as if I were playing a bassoon. Now, there are other things you can go out and purchase, like breath MIDI controllers and that sort of thing. And I imagine that's probably pretty useful. It's probably worth looking into. I don't use one. I just have looked at many videos of bassoon players prepping their breath. This is especially true whenever we get into the, the oboe or English horn, these double reed instruments. The way the breath is prepared is very specific for these types of instruments. And I have tried to, I don't know, sort of like an actor does, like prepare my breath as I perform this line. Four, what does the front of the note sound like? That is extremely important. On the one hand, we don't want to start from completely nothing. At some point, that reed starts vibrating and it does produce a sound. We do want this to bloom in a natural way, but in studying all the performances of this, there is a discernible, it's soft, but there is a discernible beginning to the note. So I tried to mimic that. You can, you can hear it. You know, it's not like the, the, the attack slider has been jacked up to make it sort of bloom from nothing because I, that, that wouldn't quite work. Uh, I probably even tried it. Didn't sound quite right, but always figure out what is the beginning of your note supposed to sound like? Perhaps it's, it needs to have more direct attack on it. Maybe it's that line between marcato or accent. There are so many different ways to interpret the notes on the page or, or if it's an original piece, what's in your head. But make sure that you have considered what the beginning of the note sounds like. Next, how does this phrase end? People often focus a whole lot on the beginning of the note, the legato transitions, note to note, and they don't necessarily spend too much time on what the end of the note is doing. For this phrase, it absolutely needs to fade down and taper in a very natural way. And taper in a natural way that would also fit the reverberation of the room. Of course a real player would play upon how, how his note might decay in the concert hall that he's performing in. But in addition to modulation and velocity, uh, okay, so my mod wheel is, is mapped to my velocity crossfade. But in addition to the velocity crossfade parameter, this is why expression is so incredibly useful, is because it gives you that little extra blend to where you don't get the timbral or tonal change from going through the different velocity layers with velocity crossfade. You are actually able to blend a little easier. So whenever you're decaying a note on a passage like this, this is what you would want to do. Perhaps if it's a fast note or a note that is supposed to end right where a new instrument comes in or something, maybe you don't necessarily, maybe you want that hard ending, a hard ending attack. The point is, is that in this checklist, how does this phrase end? For this soloistic legato passage, you want it to be tapered. I mean, this is a fermata. You want it to be tapered. You want a natural breath to take place before the phrase continues. Six, can you use the filter to adjust the tone to fit the vibe. This, I believe, is an extremely underutilized tool. It's, it's just an, a master filter. It's just an EQ filter. But shaving off some of those top-end frequencies 
it gives a phrase like this a little extra special transformation of color that I think is important. And by the time we get to the, after the first fermata, by the time we get to the embellishments, we've got the filter all the way up. And the reason I want that is because you get a little bit of key clicking in the sample, which to my ear and, and my personal view of how to make a convincing orchestral mock-up, you want a little bit of that because that would be picked up by a spot mic or a section mic. And even in live, uh, by live professional orchestras, you do sometimes hear some of that key clicking from the woodwind instruments. And so you want the filter all the way up for, for, the, for those faster passages because you get to hear the clicks. If the filter was down, they wouldn't be as apparent. Seven, do the legato transitions sound good? Can you fix them with start, offset, or a different articulation? Well, as you'll notice here, I've got a couple of different key switches. What I did is I jumped down in my matrix to the performance trill. The reason I wanted to do that is because since that is fast, the performance trill is a faster legato transition. So for those grace notes and 16th notes, that articulation seemed to flow or seemed to work a little bit better than the normal legato. There are other ways, if you have an extremely slow legato transition, let's say you've got some adagio passage, in the advanced tab on the advanced page, so to get there you go advanced and then advanced, uh, this tab and then this tab. This start offset mode is your friend. What start offset mode does, and start offset and start offset attack, is it allows you to cut into the transition sample or the sample itself. And you can choose if you want it to be the legato ones, the repetitions, all of them, just the first one, just the repetitions. I've chosen legato here. And the reason that is extremely useful is that if you were just beginning your excursion into Vienna Instruments Pro and Vienna Symphonic Libraries, dry samples, not their Synchron series, but their, but their Vienna Instruments series. You will notice that sometimes if you're going, you know, two half notes together that are adagio, the transition seems very abrupt or harsh. This is your friend. You pick the legato and then you cut into the samples by however many milliseconds. Right here I've done like 42 point whatever. Uh, and then the start offset attack. Now, that's where it'll be automatically set, and then it is controlled by the start offset scaler. So if it's up, you will get the full value of these parameters here. If it's all the way down, you will get none of this. So this allows you to to some automation if you need it, if you have sort of a slow passage or whatever. But generally, if something's fast, like these grace notes and 16th notes and groups of five and triplets and whatever in the Rite of Spring bassoon solo, you don't want this in there at all. You want those key clickings, which would be at the beginning of the sample. You don't want to cut those things out. You get the realistic movement between the two. Otherwise, it'll sound very much like a bad 80s or 90s movie score before they had all this cool stuff. And then of course, the other situation, if your legato transitions do not sound good, you should try a different articulation. Sometimes you'll have available performance legato FA for fast. Sometimes you will get um, just the normal uh, legato. And you can also use this. This is legato uh, blur. Legato blur can be, is basically the volume of the note 
transition note to note. And so sometimes automating that on a slow passage, if it's fast, generally you want it low. I think it comes default around 30 or something like that. But if it's a slower passage, you know, I'm talking like very adagio or something, you know, you can jack this thing up and get some pretty convincing results that way. But in terms of legato transitions, if some of them don't sound good, first try doing a different articulation. And honestly, sometimes you just need the regular sustain. Maybe the notes, the MIDI notes overlap a little bit from that sustain, and it's a more convincing transition note to note, like a bow change or a very lightly tongued transition between two whole notes or something like that. Sometimes that articulation works better. Sometimes it's fast and you need the performance trill patches. It all depends. I've even, um, on some of the string uh, libraries, there's a detaché. Sometimes a couple of those together could sound fairly convincing. So if the transition on a legato part doesn't sound good, begin with the start offset parameters, start offset scalar, different articulations, legato blur, and you should be able to find something that is pretty satisfactory. Next, for a tricky legato transition, have you tried overlapping the notes versus touching the notes? This is definitely true with the synchron player and the synchron strings. You can get a very, very different legato transition based on whether there's a lot of overlap of your notes. That legato blur fader on the synchron player will be especially useful in that case, or whether they're just touching, or if there's like a hair of space between it. So for the very tricky legato transitions for a uh, synchron instrument, or even in these, figure out the ends of your MIDI notes if they need to overlap a little bit, if they just need to touch each other, and you can probably come up with a solution once you dig in there. Next, would using more humanized settings create more realism for vibrato or because of the speed of a passage? For this bassoon, I've decided to use a effects, something in the effects of the humanized section of, of the Vienna Instruments Pro 2. It's an LFO that basically has the same effect as a vibrato. And so, in used in conjunction with a normal vibrato patch that happens to be also slot cross-faded with a non-vibrato patch, you can use this humanized scaler to help shape the vibrato. And as you can see here, I actually drew it to where it would kind of chill towards the end. And that happens at the same time that the slot crossfade comes through that takes it to the non-vibrato patch. Let's listen to that. For other articulations, it might be more useful to load a humanized setting that is out of tune. Fort Sandos and this sort of thing where there's a big accented attack. Maybe you want something that's, you know, it starts that quick and it shapes like that because it's so loud and there's so much attack on it. Perhaps for uh, a scale or a difficult arpeggio, you want this humanized all the way up because it's 
a fast passage and it would be humanly impossible to play every single note perfectly in tune, especially if it was a slurred figure. So always consider manipulating this human eyes. <laughs> and of course you want your virtual orchestra to sound good, right? <laughs> so, you know, take this thing down if you end on a triad at the end of the piece on a big whole note or something like that. Like you want, you want your folks to play in tune, right? An, an audience that may or may not know or may not be able to tell whether this is a real orchestra or not can always hear what's in tune and out of tune. So be careful with this. Make sure that it is used in the proper places. Next, do some of the repetition bubbles not sound good for this passage? I'm going to jump up here. To illustrate this, I'm going to jump up here to the English horn real quick. Do you hear the difference between these two? Obviously you can. This is a performance legato fast patch. This first one has a little bit of ramp up. This second dot is more direct and it seems like the oral cavity has changed a little bit. It's a little bit more direct and, and, and nasally and narrow versus this one. That seems a little more open. I mean, that is a drastic difference in tone. It's very different. So if you are having trouble on some repeated notes, or if you don't like how it fades in, if you need something that's a little bit more direct but not accented, and you want it to keep it soft, you know, down in this, you know, velocity cross phase at like zero, right? Let's say you, for whatever reason, you like this one the best. Create another articulation in another matrix or something like that and, and pull these red dots out. That is a very, very good solution in the event that you don't like the beginning note. Can you blend with the other instruments better by using the expression? Very often, you've got only so many velocity layers to work with. But if you've got velocity 100, and for whatever reason, the blend of the instruments seems off or not realistic to what it's supposed to be like, use the expression. Often orchestra players want to blend their volume without changing their tone necessarily. And so it's a phenomenon that's probably too speculative to really get into or assert in any sort of scientific manner about why this happens, but I can tell you the solution for it if something is sticking out. Consider using the expression to deal with the blend instead of velocity crossfade in case things get kind of unbalanced or uncohesive or unensemble sounding. Lastly, this is kind of a no-duh situation, but Make sure that you haven't accidentally hit a CC wheel or fader or something like that, you know, and like, like your pitch wheel stuck up here and you can't figure out why your English horn's so out of tune or something, or like the volume came down accidentally, or sometimes I've spent 10 minutes trying to figure out why I can't hit, hit an inst hear my instrument, and it was because the expression was at zero. <laughs> so go back, open up the advanced page. Make sure this all looks normal. Like, I don't know if you would accidentally move these or something, but do a 
do a check if something's starting to sound strange or unrealistic. Okay, let's go to this bassoon part again. First off, at the very beginning, we need to mark how this fits in with the French horn. In the score, it says call aparte, which is an Italian term that means you play with the soloist, with their tempo and with their phrasing. So we have our horn part, which is just two notes up and down, or two different notes up and down. And then I make sure that Everything isn't so, so lined up that, that it's absolutely perfect. But yet, perhaps, you know, the horn is entering a little bit slower uh, because, you know, we've got a little bit of, you know, we've got some attack that sort of rolls off the, the front part of the articulation in that horn. It's horn number two. And it also helps with the legato transition a little bit note to note. So it doesn't sound totally unmusical. You know, here's what that first articulation sounds like without that attack. I do want it to bloom in because there's only two instruments playing at this point. And it does still have a little bit of that attack at the beginning, but I do want it to, not like the, the second horn player would be timid about this sort of thing. He's a professional, right? But <laughs> we want it to be convincing in the sense that this isn't the solo line. This is the accompaniment. And I like how it's shaped here to where it is basically right at the same time that those two are playing right there. Because it's like they, they as, as the phrase continues, they click closer and closer together. Now, these are just kind of human things. And I don't remember specifically, but it very well may have been the case that I, as I was performing this uh, horn part, I was just playing it by its, I mean, well, obviously it's not like I recorded both of these things at the same time, but my performance here, I sort of caught up with my own bassoon performance whenever I was performing in this second horn part. And that is something that could totally happen with a real French horn player who is really listening into the bassoon soloist. Now, about these, all of this automation that's happening on the bassoon part, the bassoon solo. First of all, I'm using the bassoon two library as my first bassoon. That's because it actually has a higher range than bassoon one, from what I understand. It is also recommended that it be your principal bassoon on the Vienna Symphonic Library website. So I have uh, taken their advice. We've covered the filter, which is this 24. 27 is my human eyes. As you recall in the advanced tab, I've got human eyes all the way down at the beginning. And the reason is because it's this LFO thing that's happening. I want that LFO thing to kind of come in after a moment. And I also doubled down on that choice because with this MIDI CC here, 
I've got my slot crossfade. On slot crossfade, whenever this little thing is checked in between the 1A and 1B slots for articulations, that means that it's crossfadeable with this slider here. At the very beginning, that slot is on the bassoon 2 performance legato, no vibrato. I wanted the vibrato to bloom as the volume increased. This is something that a real player would perhaps do with a soloistic passage like this. So as this is coming down, you can see the other automation is coming up. That's my velocity crossfade. This is my expression that's coming up then. Um, the filter is coming up at that point. And then at the, sort of at the very end, you can kind of see the lines here. That's whenever we get to the uh, LFO type tuning. This humanized goes from zero all the way up to 110. So that's a lot of, that's a lot, right? Now, one thing that you'll notice is that on this first fermata, this first, or excuse me, the second fermata, that I took this tuning bubble where I knew it landed on one, two, uh, however many over that is, and I highlighted these things and I moved them around, which you can do. Uh, I don't want to do it because I don't want to mess anything up. but. I knew that it would land on this one, and so I wanted that LFO to stop and slow down as that note was finishing up. Messing with that LFO and that vibrato helps with the realism because, you know, bassoons, oboes, English horns, flutes, not so much flutes, but it's hard in virtual instruments sometimes to get a convincing vibrato with those double reed instruments. It, it, it can be. So anything you can do to help with that, it's something that should definitely be considered and experimented with. Moving on. Now you'll see up here this high note. You'll see that on control 21, what is control 10? Start scalar. You'll see whenever we get here, this high note. The legato transition from this note to this note was not convincing. The way I decided to get it a little cleaner was to use that start scaler. Cut into the sample a little bit. In the, in the normal way without the start offset, the legato transition to that high note is too slow. This speeds it up because the performer is going to be prepared for that high note. It's, I mean, it's a high D on bassoon. It's not easy to get that clean and you wouldn't be late on it or you wouldn't want to be late to it. So you would really be prepared for that as you're moving through this whole phrase. Next, on this long note, and it's the same thing here on the horn, I turned up the release a whole lot. Because this was a long note that I did kind of want to disappear into the reverb of the hall. A good way to sort of make that disappear instead of just writing down all of your... Uh, other sorts of automations like the um, 
like velocity crossfade, whatever, is to just end the note and have the release sample turned way up. So that way, the end of the note just kind of disappears. I think it's a, it's it's something that can be utilized to be very musical, and you still get your little space there to where they would be prepping for a breath and all that sort of thing. notice on this section that I've moved to the fast legato. And that's mainly to avoid that LFO tuning on those fast passages. So you notice here in these shapes with the other bassoons, these passages all together. I did, you might not necessarily hear this in very clearly in most professional orchestra performances, but I wanted to give a little shape to those lines. Da, 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 da. You know, just seems like it's a little more musical and um, nice. On that first bassoon, once we get there though, he's out of his solo part, so to speak. And so on 21, we've pulled up that start fader, cut into the sample a little bit. Uh, that makes it not so clicky and that makes it sort of more of a smooth line whenever you cut into the whenever you use that start offset mode. In addition to that, I've also used the expression on all of them to get a little bit more blend because now the English horn has his solo section and his thing is going on right now, right? Well, we want that ebb and flow thing that I've kind of programmed into the bassoons. Let me just solo these for a second. You want that to blend, so they all just need to come down there. Make room for the soloist. That's really best achieved with expression for this type of musical situation. Next, a note a little bit on mixing. So for the specific solo woodwinds, what I have done is put one of the Vienna Symphonic Library compressors. It gives you like a little bit gain and a little bit more presence in the mix. That way it's, the idea behind it is that you could play a soft solo and it has the timbral qualities of being soft, especially in the woodwind section. But for some reason, it's still able to stick out in the orchestra without everybody else playing so softly. You know, you'll see them in some, you know, woodwind players move around a whole lot. And so to me, whatever it is, is that, that human, approach to a solo part, it should stick out in your mock-up, in your mix. And since, you know, you can't move the players around on the stage, you can't have their, their woodwind instruments kind of above the stand a little bit, or um, 
doing that, whatever that sort of magical soloistic thing is, you can kind of fake it with a compressor a little bit and maybe even some EQ to make things pop or a little warm in, in some of the sections. They've got some really great presets in uh, the Vienna suite. And I, th I think they're just excellent. So the next thing for the for instruments where there's only one bass clarinet sample uh, library in the Vienna Instruments collection, and there are only two bassoons, but yet this is a score that calls for three. Well, I used on this one, this is like bassoon from special edition that's doing the second one. The first one is the bassoon two, like I said, and three is also bassoon two. Well, I've got different, just to make sure that they sound like very distinctly like different players. In Mir Pro, first of all, I've got them in different positions, obviously, but I have different characters assigned to them. The solo one is, is warm. The uh, special edition bassoon, bassoon one from the special edition is just pure. Uh, and then bassoon three, which is the bassoon two sample library, I've got the character air on it. So essentially those various characters, I mean, they're kind of self-explanatory, but I wanted to make sure that they really do kind of sound like different players, right? Um, they've got drastically different EQs. You know, some of this might seem counterintuitive that I <laughs> put air and then I carve out all this stuff above 10K. It, you know, it's by feel and it's by ear and sometimes things sound good whenever they don't make sense visually, whatever. But one other thing that I did just to put some uniqueness on the solo bassoon part is I've got two harmonic exciters. One is manipulating the even ordered harmonics, which I can't remember which one, and the other one's doing the odd ordered harmonics. Um, and then just, and you know, maybe this even is a little high in the amount or the drive, but for whatever reason, I, I landed on it and I felt like this was a pretty convincing tone or timbre for it. So you don't have to commit to one whenever you're doing some harmonic exciter stuff. Uh, just mess with it. You could do both and just keep, make sure that, like, don't go crazy with this amount because it'll, it, it will really sound bad pretty quick. But I did, I did two there in addition to some Lucy Q. Oh, finally. Yes. So there's one issue with this bassoon part. On this specific articulation. Bassoon to performance legato. No vibrato. And I'll show you. I'll solo this and I'll show you. And you will be able to see in the input what's going on. I'm gonna take these things out for a second. Look at that. That note right there that's the fundamental on the left. That's the first order harmonic or whatever it is. It's louder. To fix this sort of mix issue to where, you know, on, on some smaller speakers, I mean, that frequency was really, was really loud. I've got some automation going on. And that way it just chills it out for a second. So sometimes you need to get creative whenever funky things like that happen. And automation is real easy in Vienna Ensemble, whatever this is, six. Um, automation mapping, I've assigned it to 
you know, this and it affects this. Just the gain of the fifth band of EQ here. And that worked pretty well. And that way I don't lose that frequency on other notes. I can still maintain the full sonic spectrum of the instrument. But whenever it does that, because I like it to switch the non-vibrato, but it was just that one frequency was really sticking out in a funny way. <laughs> 